Hey, welcome back. So, um, this morning when I was waiting for Alex to get to work, no, I'm just kidding, waiting for Alex to get here, uh, I put the cam bearings in Tony's uh, engine. We were going to show that on camera. We'll show it again. I have showed installing cam bearings before, but and this is a, just a test cam. This is just an old cam that I have that I use to make sure the bearings fit nice, and they do, so we're happy with that. I'm going to show you, use Mike's engine to show you a little tip about how to make sure you got the bearings in the right place. So putting cam bearings in, it can be a kind of a tedious job. Most people uh, go to a machine shop to have that done. And if it makes you feel better, you can, because uh, it is uh, kind of a tedious job. And, and it's not hard to make a mistake. There's a bunch of things can go wrong putting a cam bearing in. And anybody that's put them in for a long time, if they tell the truth, probably scratched up a couple of them and had to replace them. And you can't buy one bearing, you got to buy the whole set. So obviously you don't want to do that. So I came across, here's the tool that I used to use. This is a universal cam bearing install tool. And it works. I put lots of cam bearings in it with it. This little part, uh, once again, the cam's already in the engine. One, this guides the front. And the problem with... A universal tool there's different fittings for every size of bearing but this is the Chevrolet is you got to tighten up this nut at the end you get just the right amount of preload on the bearing if it's too sloppy if it's not tight enough then the, the uh, these uh, uh, devices will slide underneath I can't remember the name for them right now balls or whatever they are Slide underneath, and if you tighten it too much, then the bearing's got some hoop stress in it, and it's going to be difficult to get in. So, it's a bit of a tricky operation. And the next thing you have to be sure is you get the bearing in the right place. So, came across this tool, which is All Star tool, and All Star's not paying me to say this. I just bought it because it works nice. The only bad thing about this tool, it only works with small block shafts. There may be other all-star tools made for other engines. I don't know. But this one's made for small block shafts. I think I only paid about $75 Canadian. I've talked about it before. This completely takes the stress out of installing cam bearings. And uh, I put these bearings in in probably 10 or 15 minutes this morning. Uh, one of the things that you want to make sure you do is, uh, and I've showed this before, there is a, an ideal place to put it when the bearing is upside down. If you put the little hole, there's one little hole, and inside the block of the engine, there's an annular ring. And that annular ring, by the way, uh, feeds the main bearing of the crankshaft. It goes around that bearing, through that bearing, and feeds the main bearing of the crankshaft. And that little hole is where the oil gets in to feed the camshaft bearing. So it's pretty important. So you got to make sure that you get it in exactly the right place. So uh, there are different points of view on this, but typically if you put that hole at eight o'clock when the block's upside down, you pretty much have to put the bearings in when the block's upside down. When you rotate the block, it'll be at two o'clock. And the ideal of that is to create a little oil wedge. When the camshaft's turning, the oil wedge gets to the bottom and forces the cam off the bottom of the journal. So. That's kind of the idea. So the other thing I wanted to show while we're at that is uh, one way when you install the bearing, there's another thing that you have to do. And if I can stand, find my oil can. <laughs> uh, okay, here it is. So I'm going to use Mike's in to show, engine to show that because it doesn't have a camshaft in it. So if one of the ways to show that, maybe if I take this bearing cap off, I just uh, installed it loosely here. So once again, there's a little annular groove uh, and that bit, that annular groove feeds from the main tunnel and that's how your main bearing gets oil. So that annular groove is important, but the main thing we're now we're worried about having the, the uh, hole in the right place so that annular groove also feeds the cam bearing. So one of the ways of doing that, if you spray, squirt a little bit of oil into the main bearing, and you can see it dripping down into the cam bearing. So we know we got a good connection that the oil is going from. It actually, when it's running, it goes the other way. 
goes from here up to the main bearing. But right now we know that that bearing is lined up, the hole is lined up properly, and that camshaft bearing is going to get oil. So just a couple little points that you always try to think about things that people might find helpful. There's jobs like this that you might find intimida intimidating, but they're not really that hard. If you think about it, do your homework, and uh, you may have to invest some parts. For what it's worth, this all-star tool, one-time purchase, save you the machine shop would charge more than that just to install the camera bearing once. So you pretty much save the value of the tool on the first try. The next one's free. The engine we're working on is Tony Guzzo's 302 Z28 engine that I have right here in front of me. And it's back from the machine shop. I think I've showed this before. Uh, we had Atchison machine go over the entire block. It's been mag particle inspected. All came out all good. Uh, it was actually was a standard... Uh, Block a zero uh, was never bored before, so we had a board thirty thousand seven inch, uh, nice hone in it. Uh, we've actually got Ford's pistons ordered for it. We're kind of taking it a step at a time. Uh, Tony and his buddy uh, Robert brought down two original Z twenty eight engines for me to build, and these guys have original Z twenty eight. They want them to be exactly like they were in the factory. They will be three o twos. I'm not going to cheat on it. Tony's crankshaft is in the machine shop right now. So uh, brings up a subject of discussion. So in the previous video, I showed putting a core plug in Mike's engine. And uh, I called it a frost plug, and I got in trouble for that. Lots of guys said that's they're not frost plugs, they're core plugs. So the real answer is it doesn't really matter. The plug doesn't care. And... So what do they do? So why do they call it core plugs in the first place? They call it be that because in the manufacturing process, when, when the blocks are being cast, uh, they're cast in a steel, it's not steel, it's molten, basically pig iron, melted pig iron around 2,700 degrees, uh, poured into a mold. And what they do, mold determines the shape of the casting. And wherever they don't want, iron to go, they put silica sand. Silica sand with a binder is pretty strong and it's got a higher melting point than the iron does. And so it doesn't melt. And so it stays in there until the block is cooled down. And when it does, you need a way to get it back out. So they put cores in it and there's two in the front. Now these cores, this block is so old, it's a 68 block. They are big pipe plugs, but in later blocks, they're cross plugs or curl plugs, whatever you please, at the front, two on each side, and two more at the back. Uh, 400 blocks, not that one, but the four bolt, main four bolt, 400 blocks actually have, you can see in the casting here, they have another core plug here. So they actually have uh, two more core plugs than every other small block chev. But normally they have two, four, six, eight plugs. So so I called them frost plugs and I got in big trouble. So to be a sport, uh, I decided to follow up on that. And the other thing, when I did it, I used my big old ugly socket around here, which is here now. And I said, you know, if you haven't got the right tool, you can use a socket and get away with it. Pretty much that's how I've been doing it uh, all my life. And that's how a socket works. So I got corrected on that. So, you know, I thought I would be a sport because I said, you know, if you don't have the right tool, so how much does the tool cost? I went out and bought one. So inch and five eighths. And this says, by the way, the guys that sell it, I call it a freeze plug. And this is an all-star product. All-star makes pretty good tools. And they call it a freeze plug driver. And when you look at Mr. Gasket plug set, they call it, Mr. Gasket also calls it a freeze plug. So, you know, it doesn't even matter what it is, right? It does the same thing. So I've also seen in the past, if you live in the north, that's probably why we like to call them freeze plugs because the engines freeze in the wintertime. I've actually seen plugs when the water freezes, pop the plug out. When water freezes to a solid, there is no force in the world that's going to hold it back. And that includes the cast iron engine block. Something's got to give. Something's got to break. 
if the plug can pop out and create a little bit of room for expansion, that sometimes will save your block. Don't depend on it because lots of blocks still get cracked, but they do serve that purpose. And that's probably why many people call them freeze plugs. So we've got two issues. Are they freeze plugs or core plugs? And is it okay to use a socket versus the right tool? Well, if I'm trying to help people that uh, basically are trying to do stuff at home that don't own machine shops, although if I help them too, that's great. So this costs about $40. I bought it on Amazon plus tax, 45 bucks per time I got it here. This is for the most common size, which is inch and five eighths. If you're gonna get into doing this, then you need one for every size. There's a lot of other sizes. And some of the sizes, go on Amazon, check for yourself, are almost $100. So if you wanna cover the range, you've got a lot of money invested in plugs and in, in tools. So today I'm gonna to put a frost plug in using a one to five eighths freeze plug driver. So. One of the things when I demonstrated it, I like to think about uh, when you do any process like this, how did the guys at General Motors in 1968 put freeze plugs in? I don't think they went to their cupboard and got some Permatex sealant and took it out and dabbed some around to make sure that it's sealed before they put it in. And one of the points about a freeze plug driver is that the argument was that you shouldn't push on the body of the plug. You should push on the lip of the plug. And as you can see, the freeze plug driver doesn't push on the lip of the plug either. It pushes on the body of the plug. One advantage of it, this is obviously plastic and not steel. It's probably a little softer, a little easier on, uh, on the plug, less likely to scratch it. But in the time it took me to do this, I would imagine the guys on the production line at GM would have put all the freeze plugs in more than one engine just in the time it took to tell, to tell you about it. So we're going to put one in this way and see how that goes. So give her a little shot, make sure we got it square before we start driving hard. Now, if you keep going with this one, it'll actually get the plug a little bit past the depth. So I want to make sure I'm totally engaged. There we go. Now the lip, this lip now is preventing me from overdriving it. That's probably a good safety factor because if you're not careful, typically when I do it the old way, when I get close, I go around the edges and drive the last 16th of an inch or so that way. So take your pick. Is it a freeze plug or a core plug? Is this tool better? Is it worth 40 bucks for you to buy one and buy one for every size? Or can you use a black ugly socket? We'll leave that up to you guys. Okay, here's the tip of the day. And this is a tip that I, Mike uh, Kimball, just found this uh, somewhere doing, he's always doing research. I've never actually done this before. And I'm not sure that the demo will be that helpful because this is Tony Guzzo's block. It's already been hot tanked and jet washed. This dock block is ready to assemble. It's pretty darn clean already. Uh, but in the demo that Mike saw, uh, he said you could actually see the moisture coming out of the block. So we have to paint Tony's block. In the previous clip, we installed a couple of frost plugs and we're gonna install them all because usually I leave the frost plugs to have a contrasting color with the block but when gm painted these blocks they were actually already assembled they actually got spray over the valve covers and lots of other places they weren't supposed to uh, so they didn't worry about that so the original engine would have had the frost plugs painted so we're going to paint these as well so one of the things is just to use an ordinary torch i can use a heavy duty torch or just a light propane torch and just go over the block if it's got any moisture in the cast iron It'll drive that moisture out and you're going to get a good solid base for your paint job. So let's just try that and see what happens. So, okay. I kind of see it making, changing color there. Now, once again, I don't think there's much moisture in this block, but if you just had a, a block that you cleaned in your backyard with a power washer, like I sometimes do on budget belts, then uh, 
you might see a lot more a lot more moisture come out so we'll do it anyways before it uh before we paint mike's uh block or uh, sorry tony's block and i'm just going to grab i just thought of something else i should have included and that is the original we'll paint the block chevrolet orange of course because that's what it was but this the latest original cast iron spray finish uh called cast blast it's a nice product the last few blocks that i've done i've been painted with this uh, on a primer so a couple coats of primer let it cure overnight uh, next day uh your finished coat of in this case chevrolet orange hope you found that interesting and helpful thank you for watching gold scratch